Understanding and addressing value, from the front lines to leadership, is essential to improve outcomes, enhance the patient experience, and reduce cost. Welcome to Advancing Health, the podcast of the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, Senior Writer with AHA. Brought to you by the American Hospital Association's The Value Initiative and Physician Alliance, the Value Rounds podcast series, Working Towards Value Together, will feature leaders from the field to explore how clinicians and hospital leaders must work together to address healthcare value and affordability. Joining us today for part four of the podcast series is Priya Bathesia, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the AHA, in conversation with Dr. Michael Souk, Chief Physician Officer of Geisinger System Services and Chair of the Musculoskeletal Institute and Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Geisinger Health, and Dr. Brooke Buckley, Chief Medical Officer at Henry Ford Wyandotte Hospital. Priya? Thanks, Tom. Welcome, Dr. Souk and Dr. Buckley. To get us started, tell us a little bit about you and your role. Dr. Sook, we can start with you. Hi, thanks, Priya. Um, thanks for uh, having me join you on this uh, podcast series. It's really exciting to be with you all, and good to see you, uh, Dr. Buckley. Uh, so I am uh, an orthopedic surgeon who works at uh, Geisinger Health System in Danville, Pennsylvania. Uh, I chair the Musculoskeletal Institute, uh, as well as the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, uh, but also have a hospital side uh, role as an executive uh, associated with system services. So I uh, serve as the chief physician officer for Geisinger System Services, which has uh, really uh, a role in uh, helping to develop a clinically integrated supply chain uh, with clinical uh, input and uh, leadership around facilities and pharmacy as well. And so in those two roles, I play both a clinical uh, as well as an administrative hospital side role. I've been here uh, close to nine years uh, and uh, have uh, uh, really had an opportunity to be involved in some really innovative projects at a very innovative center. Great. Thanks. And Dr. Buckley? Yes, and thank you for uh, asking me to participate in the podcast as well. Um, it's good to see both of you. And so I am the chief medical officer at Henry Ford Wyandotte Hospital here in the uh, South River region of Detroit part of the Henry Ford Health System. Um, I'm a general surgeon by training and have spent my career uh, in several different um, areas, which has brought kind of a unique perspective. I started in a rural practice on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, subsequently uh, went to a hospital-based general surgical practice uh, in Annapolis, Maryland, and then evolved to a chief medical officer role. Have been um, significantly engaged in uh, policy and advocacy through the American Medical Association and now with the American Hospital Association, um, but have really enjoyed blending all of those elements uh, to bring that background to the administrative chief medical officer role. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Buckley, and thank you both for joining us today and being part of this important discussion on value. So let's get started. Um, we all know that hospitals are continuously working towards improving value, which we have defined broadly to include strategies that lower costs, improve outcomes, and enhance the patient experience. How, how do both of you view value in your work and in your roles? Um, both from a clinical and an administrative perspective. Dr. Stuck, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, thanks, Priya. That's a great uh, question to start off with. And I would say that um, the definition as you've uh, prescribed it there is, is spot on. I think early in the discussions of value, we focused heavily on cost and outcomes, uh, really uh, wanting to be able to maximize outcomes at the lowest cost. But uh, adding the uh, factor of patient experience, I think is critical uh, when we think of value. And it's those three lenses from which uh, I try to view uh, both the clinical and administrative side of the work. And so in my current role at, uh, at Geisinger as a chief physician officer for system services, um, we focus a lot on trying to help develop a clinically integrated uh, a supply chain where physicians get a significant amount of transparency and understanding about the costs of care, uh, focusing not just on the cost of individual widgets, which are helpful, uh, but really on the total cost of care. 
Uh, and in doing so, it gives physicians, I think, a significant tool in understanding how they can improve value, uh, where they can make independent decisions about helping to reduce that element of the value equation. I think in addition, as a clinician uh, in orthopedics and our musculoskeletal institute, uh, we are at the forefront of, uh, of the collection and reporting and analysis of patient reported outcomes in all of our patients uh, who undergo conservative and operative care. Uh, to the point where our full uh, entire enterprise, every patient who is seen at Geisinger uh, has a, uh, a, a, is um, asked to uh, fill out a patient reported outcomes instrument so that we can help measure our own success uh, from the lens of the patient. And then finally, that third element on patient experience is front and center, both on the hospital as well as on the clinical side. Uh, where, uh, you know, enhancing the patient experience is uh, really uh, an effort that's derived from the feedback that we get uh, and assuring that the patient is at the center of what we do. And so we have uh, largely rejiggered uh, the, uh, our clinical approach uh, to take patients with potentially multiple complex problems and put them at the center uh, of the equation rather than having them go to multiple facilities or multiple sites to get uh, answers for a complex problem. We try to cohort the complex problems so we bring everybody who can help solve them to the patient. And so that's really changed the way we think about, uh, about uh, delivering care to make it easier uh, for patients, uh, but doing so in a way that enhances the value. That, that's really great. And one of the things we heard early on when we started our work with the value initiative was that if you start with patient experience, and work backwards, you'll automatically get to lower costs and better outcomes. And I think that Geisinger, through a lot of your experience, has started to sort of see that play out. Brooke, do you, do you have thoughts on this question about how you're viewing value in your work and your role? Yeah, I would, I would love to just share a couple of thoughts. Um, I really appreciate having added experience, patient experience to the value equation. And I, I say that because um, as a chief medical officer and that liaison between the administration and the medical staff, um, I live in a world where I'm constantly translating and balancing um, what feel often like competing interests. And so I think that um, in a organization like Henry Ford, where we are uh, pride ourselves in being uh, relationship based. Um, we really hold a key value of the importance of plurality of medical practice, meaning both uh, private practice as well as employed physicians and trying to create space for that tension that patient experience piece and the provider experience piece um, allows for um, solutions around individualization. So as we're moving towards um, lower cost and higher values, higher quality outcomes, that really drives um, in the HRO principles towards standardization. And in a world and a culture where we're asking all kinds of questions about individuality and about autonomy and about, um, you know, who am I in, in a broader context, um, having the experience piece really allows for a channel for individualization about bringing your whole self to that care experience process. And then the next step, driving the value out of that in the more traditional cost and quality context. Um, so, you know, so for me, it's really um, using the language around the individuality and autonomy um, as a human and bringing that to the value equation um, as it relates to institutions, organizations, and communities. Thanks, that, that's a great perspective. Um, and we're, we're living toward in um, some interesting times here with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I wanna make sure we touch on that a little bit, um, but from a clinical perspective, how do you think value will be viewed by patients after the pandemic? Um, what do you think will change in how they want to engage in healthcare in the future? Um, Dr. Buckley, what do you think? Thank you, Priya. I, I actually really love this question, um, not so much as it comes from COVID-19 specifically, um, but 2020 has really uh, put us at the altar of a broad pandemic in almost every sense of the word. So I would include social, political, economic, 
um, as well as infectious disease in sort of our understanding of pandemic. And really, um, we got to touch in the last question about how that affects the institution and the providers. But I think this piece in terms of how it affects patients um, is really key to what healthcare will need to look like going forward. Um, and so I think that all of us as individuals are asking ourselves, how do I fit into the system? And in a way, um, our facility with uh, technology, with uh, things like MyChart, with 24-7 um, access, uh, with the expectation of 24-7 access as a patient, um, we have been led down a lot of paths in terms of what we should be expecting and how that should look. And this pause that's been afforded by 2020 um, really starts to get at what do I mean by that? What does 24 seven access and personalized care actually mean? And so um, for some individuals that might literally mean some version of a concierge access um, where everything is at their their personal um, ability to achieve, uh, meaning that I can walk into my doctor's office uh, whenever I need to, or I can get access to an actual human at a moment's notice. Uh, for others, and we see this in some of our younger um, population that are in the workforce and, and entering um, their um, adult behaviors, that it's all about access to technology. So I may not really want to speak to a human but I want to be able to get an answer. I want to be able to get at, um, am I safe? Should I stay in my house? Should I go to urgent care? Should I go to the emergency department? Um, can I just get this prescription refilled? And what salient information does my physician actually need to be able to make that determination? And so with um, some of the relaxation on some of the rules that have brought us enhanced telemedicine, um, the medical profession is asking ourselves, what is the value proposition there? What are the pieces that should stay? And simultaneously, we're asking ourselves, what are the pieces that we really lose in the doctor-patient relationship um, by doing this through a, um, a televised or a, a um, digital audio mechanism? And so I think that to kind of land the plane here, that patients are going to be um, asking for value in terms of how it feels to their person and how it feels to their communities that they're connected to. Um, it will start to drive the actual value proposition on social determinants, um, on access to care. And um, those will both be meaningful for those populations as well as the individuals that represent those populations. Great. And, and I think the point, I just want to emphasize the point you made that the value proposition really is going to be driven by what the value is for an individual or the community that they live in. And I think that that's a really um, important point for us in the healthcare field to sort of acknowledge as we move into the future. Dr. Sook, what do you think changes in how individuals look at value? You know, it's interesting. Um, I, first of all, I agree with uh, everything that Brooke has brought out in, in the context of um, you know, the pandemic causing us to rethink about relationships, both institutions and individuals. Um, to me, you know, the, the, the silver lining in the pandemic is that it, it, it really did cause a major pause uh, that uh, forced us to rethink uh, and reset uh, just about everything. And so you saw a massive spike in emergence of uh, telehealth. Uh, I think that uh, out of necessity, we had to vacate hospitals and institutions, and we really challenged our traditional notions of how we deliver care. But now, and six months into it, on the rebound, we start to really think about uh, that level of impersonalization and, and the patients who are coming back saying, I miss my doctor or I miss that uh, individual connection. Um, to the point where, you know, the pendulum may be swinging back, it may not go back to the way it was. Uh, but in the context of value from a patient-facing uh, perspective, um, I think it's I think it forces us to really rethink um, the elements of what our traditional medicine medicine was, and so in some ways that's a silver lining. Um, going forward uh, in the future, I think that a lot of these aspects of on-demand consumerism are are here to stay. Um, but I think we're going to be struggling with finding the right balance between 
you know, being able to pick up uh, a, your, your, your app and getting a diagnosis uh, versus going to a, making an appointment and seeing a physician in person or a clinician in person uh, or what level of provider that you would see in person. These things, are, I think, are going to evolve uh, over time. The pandemic, I think, accelerated that discussion, which is uh, in many ways on its way uh, toward, uh, toward uh, some new models of care. Uh, but I think that's, that's essentially what the pandemic is going to do in terms of challenging our traditional notions and increasing uh, a sense of consumerism, patient input, patient empowerment. Uh, and then finally, you know, with the aspects of, uh, of individual communities, as you mentioned, uh, it, it it takes a larger context be, beyond the individual patient and then goes into uh, their communities and the uh, attendant social determinants that affect the health of those communities as well. So we're in for a, a good uh, a good evolution that's about to start or has just started uh, as a result of this. Well, we know that you both have been as clinical leaders, key drivers of the value conversation and I I know that that is going to stay the same as we move into the future, but as clinical leaders across the country move forward, how, how can they best connect the conversation around value with the broader changes that we're seeing in healthcare delivery, um, whether that's payment reform or new care models? Um, Dr. Suk, perhaps you can start. Yeah, thanks, Priya. I think that... Um, you know, the providers who deliver clinical care are always at the front line of what uh, the patients are experiencing and also uh, the barriers that they face. And I think that it's incumbent on, on physicians and, and providers who are at that front line to be able to try to coalesce those concepts beyond uh, larger platitudes like access or free or things like that. Because the more finally we're able to determine where we can make interventions that enhance value in the delivery of patient care, the better. So, for example, we mentioned consumerism. You know, where where do we find the need and or the desire for 24-7 access, for same-day service and things like that? And how best can we, within the confines or the restrictions uh, that we do, that we have in the care delivery model, uh, enhance those things um, and potentially, if necessary, deliver an overhaul of those things. I think with regard to payment and reform, I think there's lots of current advocacy efforts going on with regard to, uh, to payment models, uh, uh, with regard to um, uh, balance billing and things like that, that uh, drive, I think, consumers of care uh, crazy uh, in the sense that uh, uh, enhancing transparency can uh, be very helpful so consumers can make the right decisions and partner with the right uh, providers. I think that the world of, of telehealth has opened up a tremendous new horizon for us and that um, where we may have been previously confined to uh, geographic borders, we're no longer confined in that way. Uh, to access opinions and uh, and uh, potential uh, um, uh, providers of care of uh, very of varying different specialties and things like that across many geographic lines. These are the conversations and discussions that I think have to happen. Um, there's no quick answer to them, but I think this is a little bit of a glimpse into the future of where we're going to go uh, now that the world of healthcare has really exploded beyond physical borders. Dr. Buckley, what do you what do you think? So it's interesting as I'm listening to Dr. Sook's answer. Um, I think I actually hear this question in a slightly different way. And what I mean by that is um, clinical leaders uh, can mean titled leadership positions. Um, and it can also really drive at one of the core values of uh, being a physician, being a provider, which is that we're each leaders in our own um, situations. And so uh, the way that I would like to kind of explore this question a little bit is that the front lines, the, the, the physicians, the providers, the nurses that are standing at the bedside that are seeing both the good and the opportunities um, throughout this really challenging time in healthcare delivery um, really have specific insight that can't be gained at a boardroom level or at a political level uh, without really important and intentional translation. And so whether that's uh, participating in local um, community and political efforts 
or uh, in the case of Dr. Sook and myself and many others participating um, in organized medicine um, and policy making um, from a provider lens. Um, I think that really the connection has got to come from the people who are seeing and experiencing and understanding firsthand um, through these larger vehicles to the policy makers, to the rule makers, um, to the business leads, so that we can make decisions that are absolutely in line with our core values. Um, and it's hard to know what your core values really mean um, unless you can see through the lens of the front line. Yeah, that's a really good point. And as, as we're thinking about that front line, um, I know both of you have really great value efforts at Geisinger and Henry Ford. How, how can you take some of those clinical efforts to increase value from the front line to a more systemic practice? And, and how can you scale them across your hospitals, your health systems, and then ultimately how can we get to scaling them across the country? Uh, Dr. Buckley, do you want to take that first? Absolutely, thank you. This is a, a great way to kind of wrap around this conversation because as we started, um, or I started really talking about people's, people and individuals and how we understand that um, through this really intense, challenging questioning of almost everything that we do, um, I think this is the other end of that spectrum where for any of these learnings and changes to really become hardwired and to become standard practice and to become the culture of the way that we deliver care to everyone in the best and safest possible ways, um, it has to scale. And so this is uh, for me where best practices, where high reliability concepts around um, guideline driven care, um, where communication, whether that's through uh, research and medical publication, or through uh, supportive uh, policy um, is able to describe and really translate those best practices. Um, and where organizations like the American Hospital Association that can bring together voices from rural communities and uh, densely urban communities to um, manage how those guidelines look in their the various geographies um, to Dr. Sook's point about enhanced communication across all of the spaces that we live and work in um, that scaling effort has got to be in those um, very best clinical practices uh, and business practices and how we make that um, work via uh, useful guidelines and standardization across the, the country and then holding those conversations um, through organizations that can bring those stakeholders together in meaningful ways. So um, from my perspective, uh, there's not much I'd add, really add to what Dr. Buckley has uh, been uh, saying. I think we're on the same page when it comes to scaling uh, efforts. I think that um, the key in scaling innovation is uh, based around uh, the concepts of both best practice as a foundation, which actually is evidence-based uh, and then has outcomes to prove that the uh, intervention is the right thing to do. Um, I think one other thing that's, uh, that's going to be part of our future uh, in relationship to scaling efforts is really around the concept of breaking down silos. And, I, and, and it has to do with uh, a, a viewpoint around total health. Uh, to recognize that uh, even though medicine and the practice of medicine is somewhat subspecialized, that the patient uh, doesn't necessarily always recognize our convenient silos in the care delivery. Uh, and so uh, this is not just applicable, I think, in individual clinical practice, but it's also, uh, I think, uh, incumbent on us to look at in on an institutional level and organizational level. And I think groups like the AHA, uh, and webinars or, or, or podcasts such as this are exactly the way we should be scaling things like this, is sharing ideas that are not necessarily proprietary to one physician or to one institution or organization, uh, but looking uh, you know, toward the future to where we can actually create a much better and healthier ecosystem of care. Uh, and um, to me, I think it's having that open dialogue uh, and a willingness to, uh, to purposely do the right thing uh, in forms like this. 
Great. Thank you, Dr. Suk. And before we end, I just have one last question for both of you, and that is, what advice do you have for your colleagues on how to think and communicate about value in healthcare? Dr. Suk? Yeah, thanks, Priya. I think that uh, if I was to offer advice, uh, I would say that the the key component to uh, the value equations we initially started is, I think both Dr. Buckley and I agree, it's really starting from that patient experience. And so looking at uh, the recipient of care, how they experience the care, uh, how we can eliminate barriers to make it easier, uh, and how we can track uh, the outcomes of that care so we make it better. Uh, I think these are the things that are uh, core elements to value. And then attendant to that is the mm-hmm. fact that uh, when you do it better and you do it more broadly, uh, I think Priya, you said it uh, best earlier, is that it will ultimately become less expensive. Uh, and uh, having those uh, opportunities to share thoughts across silos, I think, is a very important uh, element in this. Uh, and finding the colleagues of similar minds so that we can re- really create a, a movement uh, uh, around um, enhancing uh, the way we deliver care in the future. Great, great. And Dr. Buckley, I'll give you the last word. Excellent. Thank you. For me, this question really. Um, it is a opportunity to speak in a really broad stroke. And, and by that, um, so often we see ourselves and our colleagues sort of digging in deep to our own perspective, um, to our own specialty, to our own camp, our own region on what is the absolute best and most appropriate thing to do. Um, so often we hear people point out the system caused this, Uh, the institution drove this, et cetera. And I think that this is just a really incredible moment in time where collectively we're asking similar questions. And so really being able to articulate and recognize um, our our own individual talents, our own individual skill set that we bring to the table, um, and a um, opportunity to bring curiosity and our whole self to the work that we do every day, and whether that's uh, in the moment in a patient experience, or whether that's in an era uh, in terms of guideline development um, and care delivery. And so I really just uh, would urge my colleagues to be part of the change that they want to see in the world, um, that this really is gonna take all of us to do this heavy lifting. And I think it's imminently attainable in a way, I'm thankful for this moment of pause in 2020 to, open this conversation in a way that we've not been able to hear or understand uh, prior to March of this year. Dr. Buckley, Dr. Sook, thank you so much for being with us today and having this conversation around value. And above all that, for always being so supportive of AHA's The Value Initiative and our Physician Alliance. Um, We all learn so much from you and really appreciate you taking the time to share what you're learning Um, from your experiences with our broader healthcare leadership um, so that we can all learn and scale um, together. So I'm looking forward to talking with you more in the future, but thank you again for your time today. 